there's a wide diversity of angiosperms that differ in hundreds and hundreds of different ways. Um, the, the cladogram showing some of the angiosperm groups is spread out here. So we see many different lineages of angiosperms. We'll focus on just two of those lineages, the monocots and eudicots, and then we'll talk more generally about some of the different ways um, that flowers differ from each other and what evolutionary processes have led to those. So monocots and eudicots are the two groups that we'll take a closer look at. Their names, monocot and eudicot, um, refer to cotyledons, which is the embryonic leaves. Um, so these are structures inside of the embryo the cotyledons are. Um, and then monocots have a single cotyledon and dicots have two. So two and one. Um, so when we look at the mature plant, especially the flower, we can see, um, we can also tell whether it's a monocot or a eudicot because monocots have their flowers in parts of three. So if you look at a monocot, it might, for example, have three petals, or it might have six petals, or nine petals, or 12 petals, or 15 petals, um, or its other flower parts might be in parts of three, like it might have six um, stamen, for example. Um, whereas eudicots will tend to have their part, flower parts in parts of four or five, so four, eight, 12, 16, for example, or 5, 10, 15, 20, for example. So here's a classic eudicot with five petals, um, just playing those five parts. Now, keep in mind that this is like, especially petal counting is not foolproof. So if you think about something like a rose, um, a rose has hundreds of petals. And so if you were trying to count rose petals, well, in trying to count hundreds of petals, it may have lost a petal here or there. So even if you counted every single petal, odds are you might have missed a petal. Um, so especially petal counting is only going to work well when there's a small number of petals. Um, same thing goes for any of the other flower parts. Um, now, usually there's like one flower part that has a small number. So like, for example, um, if there's tons of petals, look at the sepals because maybe the sepals are only present and there's only five of them. So um, just keep that in mind that if there's a lot, a lot, a lot of something, then that's really difficult to count and there, you might be missing one or two. And so it's not as reliable for identification purposes. So in addition to the difference between monocots and eudicots, like I said, we're just going to talk about diversity in flowers generally and talk about where that comes from. So, um, we see a lot of flower diversica diversification just to um, increase the movement of pollen. And so that can be changing the amount of pollen or changing the way the pollen is transferred. Um, so for example, if we look at a sunflower, this is called an inflorescence. A sunflower is actually hundreds and hundreds of flowers. So it's got these showy petals here, which makes you think that this is just the center of one flower. But actually, if you look closely, and this is hard to do, and you kind of have to grow. So if you ever see sunflowers growing, you can do this. The grocery store ones are, you can't really do it with. Um, but when one is growing, if you look really closely at this interior part here, there's actually hundreds and hundreds of little teeny flowers. And you can actually see little teeny flowers, little teeny petals and a little teeny inside. Um, so there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flowers here. And each one of those flowers will produce a sunflower seed across here. Um, the one set of showy petals is just to attract pollinators to these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flowers. So it's really efficient. It's like putting up one sign in order to attract pollinators to hundreds and hundreds of flowers rather than having to put up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signs, right? So it's just efficient. Um, another sort of interesting thing we see with flowers is a huge reduction in, in, um, in the, the appearance of the flower. So if we look at this one here, it lacks all showiness. 
So lacking the showy parts suggests that it doesn't need to advertise to anyone, right? So it doesn't need to put up a sign at all. And that's because um, this is a plant that is wind pollinated. So most angiosperms are pollinated with the help of insects or some other animal, but grasses are known for being wind pollinated. And so you see this, there's no um, showy parts. They reduced their showy parts through the process of evolution because they don't need to attract anybody. They just rely on wind. And so you know, the, the side effect of this is that grasses do well in windy places. So are they, you know, they kind of go together with windy places. So think of like American grasslands or prairie, for example, being a place where there's a lot of wind and the grasses that are wind pollinated do well there. Um, in some cases, flowers have fused petals. So instead of having, you know, five distinct petals, you know, like that, these have all become connected to each other. And what you have instead is like a little tube. And my lovely drawing. Um, and and that, that can be beneficial because a tube is going to accumulate a large amount of nectar at the bottom of it. And so this can attract nectar, um, especially larger organisms that have a, a desire for nectar. All right, so fruit develops from the ovary walls, as I mentioned, in the life cycle. Um, and the fruit, fruit comes in very different appearances. Um, the function of fruit is to aid the dispersal of the seeds. So um, sometimes people get confused and think the fruit is for the plant. Like the peach it seems so luscious to us. It must, of course, be useful to the plant and we're just stealing it from the plant. But actually, that's a total reversal of the situation. The plant has no use for the fruit. It's literally making the fruit to entice animals like us to eat it. Because when animals like us eat it, we take it with us and move it to other places. So remember, plants can't move but animals can. And so this fundamental difference means that plants will constantly be trying to lure animals to them or somehow take advantage of animals and their ability to move. So they want animals to come and eat their fruit because animals can move and take that the seeds elsewhere. So that allows them to take it somewhere away from the mother plant. So especially if you think about like a tree, a tree doesn't want her babies to be right underneath her because her babies will never do well underneath her. The tree wants her babies to go far away from her where they won't compete with her. So fruits are oftentimes adapted for animals to eat them. Um, and so that's one of the ways that they get dispersed. Now, interestingly, there's some other variants. Um, fruit may be optimized for wind dispersal. Um, it can be optimized to attach to fur or flesh or it can be optimized to float in water. So we'll take a look at some examples here. So here we see lots of different fleshy fruits um, that we would uh, sort of think of as fruits. Uh, and, and these are obviously attracting to animals. Here's a little more unusual of one that is still technically a fruit. So from a nutrition perspective, we might call this a vegetable, but from a um, plant life cycle perspective, this is the fruit of the plant, and these are the seeds inside of it. Other ones that kind of fit into this confusing, classified as a vegetable, but actually a fruit, are things like cucumbers, zucchinis, pumpkins, water, or no, watermelons, that's, you, you obviously think that's a fruit too. Um, what else am I thinking of? Peppers, maybe. Um, people don't realize that's a fruit. So there's a lot of things that we might think of as a vegetable from a diet perspective, but it's actually the fruit of the plant. Um, so again, those are to attract animals to eat them. A coconut is interesting. A coconut is um, has the water on the inside and this kind of open space. Um, and the purpose of that is to actually float. So coconuts are land in water. They're like living on an island. They land in water and they float to another island. And that's how they colonize new areas. This is a maple seed. Um, and these maple seeds actually spin in the wind. So the wind will come through and it will blow it off of the tree and they will like flip in the wind, kind of like a little helicopter and travel to a new place. And so this is a fruit, believe it or not. It doesn't look like something you'd want to eat. And in fact, you wouldn't want to because it wouldn't taste good. Um, but it is a fruit. It's one way that the ovary can thicken. Stickers and burrs 
which there isn't a picture of here, but stickers and burrs are also the fruit of the plant. So instead of turning into a delicious thing, they turn into some kind of burr-like thing that will um, stick into the, the fur of an animal and, and take a ride. Angiosperms are also particularly diverse in secondary metabolites. These are chemicals that a plant might make that are not essential for normal cell structure and growth, but may provide some kind of benefit. So there's several different types, and these are three classes of metabolites. So I'll talk here about what, so what they are, some examples, and why a plant might make them. So terpenes and terpenoids include things like citronella, maybe you've heard of, rubber, turpentine, rosin, amber. Um, these compounds are generally protective and antimicrobial. So this is a picture of a rubber tree being tapped. Um, so the rubber is oozing out of it. And from the plant's perspective, the rubber is helping to heal wounds and prevent infection in the site of a wound. And so that's the benefit to the plant of many of these. Phenolics, also sometimes called flavonoids, um, and that gives you a hint to their role, um, give flowers and fruits their color. They also give um, plants their aromas and flavors. So things like cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, clove, chilies, vanilla. So the functions of these are diverse. Some of them actually have roles as because they're um, their chemical, their chemical structure is uh, to be antioxidant, so they help protect the plant from UV damage. So plants want light, but UV damage comes along with light, hence the damage it does to our skin. Um, and so they also need compounds that help protect them from it. Um, in some cases, the aromas and flavors are also attracting to um, attracting to something that might want to eat the eat the the the, the, the fruit um, in other cases the the smell might be repellent um, and so it may actually keep bugs away depends on the compound the third family is the alkaloids um, these ones are generally produced by plants as a toxin to prevent consumption. Um, so they have potent effects on animal nervous system. They include things like caffeine, nicotine, morphine, ephedrine, cocaine, and codeine. So you'll recognize some of these names, I think, as some um, major drugs uh, that we have taken advantage of for good or ill. Um, and so the intended purpose from the plant's perspective is to deter consumption, so to make you know, the, the thing that eat it feel bad and so that it doesn't come and eat it again. Um, and so that, that works to some degree in nature, humans being a, a weird exception. Okay, so the evolutionary relationship where a lot of plant traits come from is what's called coevolution. It's the process by which two or more species of organisms influence each other's evolutionary pathway. So in other words, it's when organisms are evolving traits that fit or match each other um, because they both benefit from that relationship. Um, and so it really explains a lot of plant diversity, the way that flowers are shaped, the way they smell, the way they look, and same thing with fruits, how they smell, what they're shaped like, um, what they smell like. Um, because plants are really reliant on animals for pollen and seed dispersal. So again, remembering this relationship of plants can't move and animals can. So there's this relationship where um, plants rely on animals to get to move stuff around, whether that's pollen or their seeds. And then on the other hand, plants can do photosynthesis and animals can't. So animals have this dependency on plants for food. So it's this mutual, very strong dependency that um, coevolution is reliant on. So pollination coevolution is when a pollinator, the animal, and a plant have co-evolved with each other. Um, so pollinators do a huge service to plants because they're able to move pollen from other plants far away to the plant here, right? So again, moving the pollen for the plants. And so that way, a flower in one area of town can get the genetics of another flower from another area of town. So you're getting a mix up of the genetics, genetic variation, which remember is the raw material of evolution. Um, pollinators are fairly faithful, um, and this is a benefit for the plant. So pollinators will learn a flower's characteristics 
and then will preferentially ret return to that plant. And in fact, many pollinators will actually sort of dedicate a day. So like they're like honeybees, for example, like, okay, today I'm doing dandelions. And so all day long that that bee is doing dandelions. And so that's really great for the plant because dandelion pollen is always getting to dandelion flowers. Um, if pollinators were less faithful, that would be not as great because rose pollen is not going to help the dandelion, for example. So um, plants have co-evolved to attract the pollinators they, that are ideal for them using certain colors, odors, shapes of their flowers, and sizes of the flowers. Those all have to match with a specific pollinator or set of pollinators. So in many cases, coevolution has led to pollination syndrome. So this is when flowers become specialized for very particular pollinators, and it can be in a very exclusive relationship. Um, and so that, that relationship has become so exclusive that they're dependent on that pollinator. They don't have any other options. They, so if you have a pollination syndrome between a flower and a bee, for example, if the bees aren't there, then the flower can't reproduce, right? Because the bee isn't there. Whereas if you have a more generalist flower, um, where bees and butterflies can pollinate it, right? There's not as a, a tight pollination syndrome. Well, then if the bees aren't there, a butterfly can do the pollination and the flower is okay, right? So pollination syndrome is just a natural outcome of coevolution in many cases. It only becomes a problem if there's something bad happening to the pollinator or the plant, right? So we sometimes when we see this word syndrome, we think disease, it's not a disease. It's not even normally a problem. Again, it's a normal result of coevolution. The only problem that arises is if you're losing one of the partners because they're now their fates are inter, are interrelated. If the pollinator goes extinct, then the, the plant will go extinct. If the plant goes extinct, the pollinator may go extinct as well. So that relationship has become really exclusive. So um, for example, depending on the plant traits, it can really limit who pollinates it. And we'll look at more examples of this, but like birds, for example, um, will be the only things that can pollinate an odorless red flower. Um, bees will have a preference for blue, purple, yellow, or white flowers that have a sweet aroma. So they're attracted to odor. Um, that's, that's a sweet floral aroma, not a stinky smell, basically. So um, this is showing us, again, the relationships of, of the pollination syndromes. So again, pollination syndromes are the result of coevolution. Um, so bees have color vision. Um, they have with ultraviolet. Um, they cannot see red. They have a really good sense of smell and they need both nectar and pollen. The nectar is what they use to make honey and to eat, um, to feed themselves when they're adults, but they feed pollen to their young. So they need to be able to get both from flowers. So because of this, they're co-evolved with flowers that are blue, purple, yellow, white. So anything that's not red, basically, and with flowers that are fragrant and that have nectar and abundant pollen. Butterflies also have good color vision. Um, they can see red, though. Um, they can sense odors, but only with their feet. They do need a landing place. So they can't pollinate while flapping their wings. So they have to be able to land on the flower. And then they have a tongue that they stick down into the flower. So blue, purple, deep pink, orange, and red flowers are all suitable for them. A light floral scent is a, a, a good fl flower feature, but they do need a landing place and they prefer nectar that's in deep, narrow floral tubes that they can stick their, stick their tongue down. Moths are active at night. They have a good sense of smell and they also feed with the long, thin tongue like butterflies. So they need flowers that open at night and that they can see in the darkness. So generally white or bright colors like yellow. They have a preference for heavy musky odors rather than floral scents. Um, and they also need nectar in deep, narrow tubes because of their tongue. Birds have color vision. They, um, they can see red as well. Um, most of them also require perch, so the exception being <laughs> um, hummingbirds. 
They don't smell, so they have a poor sense of smell. Um, they are active during the day. They, in particular, need high nectar requirements. Um, so they really get a lot, they need a lot of energy from that nectar. Hummingbirds need to be able to hover, so they don't perch, they don't need to perch, but they have to be able to hover. Um, so the flower has to be like hanging, basically. So birds can handle, will go after red flowers. They do need the flower to be, um, like have a solid footing. So something like a tree is going to work for a, 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 a bird, but not like a soft flower. They don't need fragrance. They do need it to be open in daytime. They prefer flowers with a lot of nectar because they're not going to go messing around with something that just has a small amount of nectar. They're much, 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 much bigger in bee, than bees. And they need something they can stick their face down into, so they generally go for floral tubes as well. Hummingbirds have a preference for hanging um, so that they can hover over it. Um, bats are another more unusual pollinator people don't think of. They're colorblind. Um, so they're not going to be attracted to, to, to colors. They do have a good sense of smell and they prefer strong odors. They also need flowers that are open at night because that's when they're active. And then they have high food requirements. So they also need a lot of nectar and pollen. Again, they're big, not like a bee. And then, um, because they use echolocation to navigate, um, they are going to have a preference for hanging flowers or things born on tree trunks. So these are some of the pollination syndromes that we see. So a couple of examples here. So here's a um, zinnia flower. So notice the butterfly has a place to perch. It's like an orangey peachy color and it has these tubes that its little tongue can go down into. Um, this is a hibiscus flower and a hummingbird. Hibiscus flowers are big. They're really big, like as big as your hand. Um, and they kind of have this tube area that the bird can stick its head down into. Um, and then there's an abundant amount of nectar here. And notice it's red as well. And then here's a bat. This is a white flower that would be visible at night and it's large and can fit the head of the, of the bat down into. So seed dispersal coevolution has also influenced plant characteristics, specifically the fruit. So we see fruits that are juicy, sweet fruit um, that attracts uh, that attracts the animals. Um, in many cases, if it has a small seed, it needs to be able to survive the gut. Um, so something like a raspberry or a strawberry, for example, those seeds are designed to resist the animal gut. They come out in poop and they're ready to, to germinate. Whereas a lot of things when they go through the stomach acid would be damaged. Um, so that's how plants have attracted um, animals. Interestingly, plants oftentimes have to balance attraction versus warding off animals. So if you think about something like a blackberry bush, a blackberry bush um, has very delicious fruit, um, but it also has thorns on it. And so it's trying to get like birds to like lots of little birds to eat its fruit while deterring something like a bear from just sitting and eating all of the fruit. Um, so plants kind of have this delicate balance with their partners. Um, so when fruit ripens, uh, as it ripens, maybe you've seen like an unripe peach, for example, it's like green and hard and it doesn't smell very good and it doesn't taste very good. Um, it's not as sweet. As it ripens, it gets softer. The color changes to a brighter color generally. It gets sweeter um, and generally becomes more desirable. So it's doing that because as it's ripening, that's what it's seeds maturing. So when a fruit isn't ripe, the seeds aren't ready either. So that's helping basically, again, kind of that balance that plants are dealing with. They want their fruit to get eaten, but not too soon. So ripening of the fruit helps the, the fruit not get eaten at the wrong time. Okay, and on a last note, humans have done a lot to plant evolution. Um, so the process of domestication is when humans have artificially selected for traits that are desirable for humans. And I'll say in many cases, these are not good traits in the wild. It's not always true, but our interest, the interest of humans is oftentimes not in the interest of plants. And this is a classic example. Um, in the wild, grains will tend to shatter. 
So you have something like an intact and all the seeds are here and it will shatter on its own and break off and make the individual seeds. So that's shattering. So this is great for plants in the wild because they want their seeds to break apart and scatter onto the ground into different spots so that next in the springtime, those seeds can germinate and make new babies. Um, this is a terrible trait though a really terrible trait if you're an early human farmer um, because if they shatter onto the ground, actually, I should say not just early human farmer, it's still a bad trait because our machines aren't designed for it either, but it's a really bad trait because if it shatters before you have a chance to harvest it, then you're trying to pick up the seeds from the ground and that's a lot of work. Um, and so what humans did was they selected for a, a to for, for loss of shattering. So humans selected for loss of the shattering trait. So what we wanted was a domesticated corn that held on to its seeds so it doesn't shatter. And in fact, if you've ever had a ear of corn, a dried ear of corn like this um, in your house, you'll know that in fact, it takes a really long time for those, those ear, those, um, seeds to come off. And in fact, if you really want them to come off, you have to get on there with your hands and kind of scrape them off or use a machine to do it. And this was much better for, um, for farmers because now you could take the seeds off when you wanted to and they weren't falling off on the dirt. And so this, this um, loss of shattering traits is really interesting because every different human civilization selected against the shattering trait with whatever grass they were growing. So in the Americas, you had the Native Americans selecting for the loss of shattering in corn. In the Middle East, you had the early people there selecting for the loss of shattering in wheat. You had people selecting for the loss of shattering in rice. So this particular trait was, um, was selected for by all the different groups of people that domesticated grains across the globe at different periods in our history. Um, and this is just a, a one trait that humans have selected for. All of our crops, all of our plants that we eat have undergone extensive um, human manipulation and artificial selection to get the traits that we prefer, either for taste or for productivity or for harvestability, um, for storage traits. All of these different traits um, gives us the wide array of food that we rely on.